to, uh, I'll post the link to the document. I remember this time. So this is a, the document that I'm going to go through. And this came from a, a couple of uh, a couple of sites, some of my own information and stuff like that. And then a couple of different uh, sites of people I trust. And I'll share some of that information with you after um, regarding um, what to do at the end of the year with this and, and some of the some of the uh, potential tripping points and everything. So, uh, sorry, I should uh, turn that off here. Uh, that's all right. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get started. I will walk through this along with you. Um, so I'll walk through the process on one of my classrooms, uh, but please feel free to share this document. Uh, hopefully you guys all have access to it. Hopefully you can see it. Um, share this document with whoever needs to in your school or something like that um, so that you can use it. But essentially, I've, I've broken it down into seven points and not all of them are online ones. Some of them are ones to do on your own uh, without actually doing anything with regards to the classroom. And then it gets into some of the classroom ones. So obviously, number one being to reflect. If we scroll to page two, I've added some additional notes with regards to what you can do on this. This is one that we can I shouldn't uh, be presenting here. Um, this is one that we can just discuss, right? I mean, this is one that you're going to do your own personal reflections on is how did it go, right? Um, how did you use all the different pieces of classroom? Did you have a good organizational scheme? Uh, I actually had a teacher earlier this year uh, that emailed me and told me that she ran out of topics uh, that she could use in classroom. She, I didn't know this, but Google Classroom has a maximum of 100 topics. And the organizational scheme that she had set up was using multiple topics on any given day. So some days she was using four different topics. So essentially after a month, she was done and had to uh, recover those, right? So how do we get out of that? Would you change your system afterwards? Um, did you use the grade book? Did, it, did you do anything with it? Or was it just kind of hanging out there in the background? I've always recommend because we use that online service from uh, PowerSchool, Power Teacher Pro, uh, to sort of hang out in in that world as opposed to the gradebook. But I do know some people who are using the gradebook, so um, there's another potential there. Uh, were there any tools that you thought I kind of want to get into this, but now is not the time, right? And you can sort of reflect on that, make some notes, uh, and then spend some professional development time over the summer. So. The other, uh, the other thing maybe to consider is uh, getting your students to evaluate their experience with it as well. So um, not necessarily the same questions, but in a, in a manner is, is how did they do, right? Can we, it's, it's always opening ourselves up to, uh, to feedback from the kids can always be interesting, especially depending on their age and maturity levels. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily correspond with their age, right, Marie? Um, but age and maturity level, uh, can sometimes be super interesting when it comes to our kids. And so, but sometimes they do have some interesting things to say and everything. So, all right. So now that we got that, now we can get into some actual, let's do something with classroom stuff. So let's pop back in. Next thing we want to do is take a look at our to-do list. The to-do list is available uh, and it's kind of generic. It's kind of all over the board. It covers all of your different classrooms or class is. But essentially, if we go up to our hamburger menu in the top left, all of us have a to-do list. And if you take a look at your to-do list, if yours is anything like mine, it is absolutely jam-packed because you've never, not necessarily went in here and done anything with it. So maybe you get assignments come in, you mark them, you never return them. You never mark it as reviewed. You never send it back to the kids or anything like that. So one of the things to consider at this point is going through these. And like I said, mine go way back multiple years here. We're back into 2015 is when I uh, touched on some of this stuff. but kind of clean it out. Make sure the assignments get back to their kids. I always recommend returning them to the kids, not just saying they're reviewed, done, I'm gonna hold on to them. Part of the reason for this is when they turn it into you, the ownership of that assignment goes from them. They used to be the owner when they started working on it. Even if you assigned a copy to each of them, they were still the owner. When they turn it in, it goes to you. So the ownership is transferred to you and they get view only rights. At any point, they can go back and unturn it in and claim that you get the notification. It's not a big deal. They get the ownership back again. But one of the things to consider is it is their property. We talked a little bit about copyright and plagiarism yesterday. It is their stuff. Get it back to them. Give it back to them, right? 
consider maybe making a exemplars folder somewhere. So if you have a kid that did an absolute seller job, just go, hey, I'm, do you mind keeping it? If I keep a copy of this, throw it in that digital folder and have a folder of these are exemplar assignments for other kids. We can narrow this down further. Obviously, up top it says all classes. We can click into our all classes and narrow it down to a specific class. Uh, we can go back if we have some archive classes that we had stuff inside of there. There's one that's all cleaned out. But if we have an archive class that we want to, I want to say maybe this one, no, that we have stuff in there we can look at. Um, and then once you're done, the easiest way to do it, click on the right-hand side and just say Mark has reviewed. Mark has reviewed. And, and I don't believe that we're going to go through all of these right now and review them all and kick them out. You can just, you know, we, we can maybe leave that. In the future, this is sort of your checklist, your to-do list of stuff that you have going on in classrooms. So, so it's somewhere to come in and take a look at. Um, hamburger menu, turn ownership. Before returning it, think about making of exemplars. Okay, cool. Can I just ask a question? Yep. About Mark has reviewed, what does that do? Does that do anything to the student? Like let's say you mark something as reviewed halfway during the year or something. Does it show yep. up any differently for the kid or is it just the same if you have an assignment or sorry if you've given them a grade on that assignment when you mark it as review it will give them the report that and that grade will go back to them okay other than that it, it doesn't yeah it doesn't do anything it's more for your benefit to say you know here's my checklist of things to do uh and i'm going to make a note because i as i say that all of a sudden i'm like are you sure jason so i'm going to uh i'm going to make a note of that and I will, I'll follow up with regards to that. So um, next thing we can do, and this one, I moved it. It used to be down under number five on my list and I moved it up to number three because I thought we might want to do this a little bit earlier. So if you look up here, number three, create a template of your classroom for use next time around, okay? If we go into any of our classes again, we're gonna go to our main classroom page here and we have our hot dog menu. Our hot dog menu has a few options inside of here, one of which, and I'm gonna grab this one right here, one of which is copy. So what you can do is if you have a classroom that is all set up and everything is exactly the way you want it, your topics are good, your organizational scheme is good, your pacing of your assignments is good, everything is ready to go, what you can do is you can just make a copy of it. Give it another name, I'm going to call it template of, let's say, grade three. Oops. Uh, section, we'll leave that out. Maybe I just want to call this templates or something like that. And we're going to hit copy. What copying does for us is essentially exactly what it sounds, but it doesn't do a couple things. It doesn't bring over our co-teachers. It doesn't bring over any announcements that we made. It doesn't bring over any deleted work that we had put in there and then deleted later on. That doesn't come over. Any student posts. So if you allow your student to make posts on the stream, it doesn't bring over any of those, right? So if we go back now, we have our template of grade three. And if we pop into there, I don't know that we have many things, but inside of our classwork, what you're going to see is instead of it just assigning all of that at once, because the minute our kids get into that, if we had it all assigned, it would just go and they would get all the assignments at once. We want to be able to control that. So it just creates all of these as drafts. We can pop inside here, edit the assignment when we're ready to assign it, add additional instructions, change it, or if everything's all good, set a due date and assign it just like before. So so essentially, it's allowing us kind of a repository of our class without making it fully and, and openly there all at once. The other thing you can do, and this was a suggestion I found, was create a template and call it awesome assignments or something like that, or assignments I want to use again. And in that case, all of your assignments that maybe you want to use in a different class, because inside of create, we can do reuse posts. Maybe the, all of those hang out in this awesome assignments class and it makes it easier to find it and pull them into another one. So, so either of those, any of those, but consider creating an assignment or sorry, a template. We will, uh, 
Yep, videos and links and in the, as long as they're materials, if they're announcements on the stream, they won't. So if you put something in the stream here, it will not copy over. But if inside of your classwork, you had a material and inside the material, you had a video or a link or something like that, it will co um, copy over. You will notice that Meet has been reset. So we would have to turn it on again. Uh, so that one, the Meet link doesn't work uh, until we turn it on, right? It doesn't pull over the same settings and everything like that. So uh, kind of lost my, my train of thought, but how about if it's an assignment? Yes, assignments. So anything that's in the classwork page under create, assignment, quiz assignment, question, material, all pull over. They all pull over as a draft and they're waiting, they're ready to be assigned or ready to be reused in another class. The people that are inside of there do not get brought over. And they, so because of that, the grades also do not get brought over. So. So once we have that, we're all in there, we create our assignments. Next thing we wanna do is we wanna jump in and take a look at our My Drive. So I'm gonna jump in here. We'll zoom in a little bit. All of you, when you started using Google Classroom, have a folder called Classroom. I labeled mine red, I brought mine red just so you could, uh, you could identify it easier. Please do not delete that folder. Everything I have read says, tell people don't delete that folder. Don't delete your classroom folder. Don't jump in. So please don't do that. Please tell people not to do that. It's just a super hassle apparently to get back and everything like that. Um, I'm fairly confident that potentially I have at some point, but please don't do that. Uh, in fact, consider maybe not deleting any of these folders, right? We have all of these folders inside of here. Maybe what we wanna do in our My Drive, well, what we could do inside of here is create a new folder call it 2019-2020 classes. And we could start dragging these into there, right? So we could say, where's our demo class? We're gonna drag that one in there. We're gonna take our, uh, I know I got another one in here. Here, we'll throw a template of grade three. I'm gonna delete that one afterwards and maybe a couple other ones. And then we could take that and we could drag it up into our Google Drive. So we could drag it out of here. It's no longer in our classroom. We're gonna keep this just for our classroom stuff, our current classroom stuff, but we don't wanna lose any of our assignments or materials or anything that potentially are inside of there. So, so take that, move it out, and then we can start also taking a look at it. We should see one, here we go, 2019, 2020, and they're all inside of there, so. Um, something to consider is uh, if you do decide to delete anything, check the ownership of it. We don't want to delete something that doesn't want to belong to us. We shouldn't have that right to, um, but we may lose access to it. Uh, don't go, don't clean out your shared with me section. Shared with me is essentially a tag that's attached. When someone shares something to, with you, a tag is attached to that file that says shared with Jason. And so then when I go to access my files, it looks through those files and it says, which ones have the shared with JSON file attached to it? And it lists those in shared with me. That is the only thing that that does. If you start deleting stuff out of there, it actually removes that tag from the file or from the uh, yeah file. And so it won't show up in your shared with me. So if Shabana had shared something with me and I deleted it from shared with me, it's still shared with me and I would have to go and find it in a different way. It's just not in that easy to find section. So not that that section's that easy to work with. So don't start deleting stuff from there. Don't worry about that. That's not a place we wanna go. Um, and I know that some people will assign an assignment and then delete it. In all of your classroom files, there is a folder that is called templates right here. We'll change the, the view of that to make it a little bit different. So templates, do not edit. So inside of there, whenever you use a file and assign it to the students and say, make a copy for each student, it puts a copy inside of here. And then it uses that to start creating the templates for all of the students, attaching their name where it says template right now. And it maintains that copy inside of there. If you reuse a post, so if inside of a post, 
we create or we reuse from another class, which is which is brilliant. So we say we use this one last year in grade three or grade seven or something. We wanted to use it again this year. Um, what it does is it looks over into that folder. It's having trouble maybe because I moved it. We'll just leave that for a bit. It looks into that folder and it says, here's the template. Do you want to use this template or do you want to use a new version? And so there's a little checkbox there and hopefully it pops up. I might have to pop into a different classroom here. We'll go into the this one right here. And we'll go to reuse. Here we go, perfect. It gives me, these are all the different classes that I have. So some of them are archived, some of them are live. I'm gonna jump into this one right here and see down at the bottom where it says, create a new copy of all attachments. So if I reuse any of my posts, I want to consider having this one checked because if I had made a change to the original file, oh, there was a typo on it. So I fixed the original, it does not update the template. The template that is in that template folder is set and done. So all you wanna do is, I always keep that one checked. It uses the most recent version of the original file. But if you are one of those people that delete that file when you're done, you assign it to the kids, your miss is clean, you delete that file, you might wanna go in here and just check and make sure that, you know, oh, I couldn't find that cat story. I wanna go in here and grab that file, drag it into there, rename it, do what you need to do. But this is where you'll find all those templates. So. Boom, so we got our, we cleared out our folder, everything's good. Eventually we're gonna have a nice clean folder there. Uh, we want to now take a look at our calendars. So whenever you create a classroom, and if you look over on the left-hand side here, you also get a calendar with that classroom. So I have my demo class, my document camera class, general, and so on and so on. You can turn those on and off so you can see you know, if you don't want to shoot, don't want them visible at all times, um, it doesn't really matter. But they are still hanging out back here. So we're going to pop up to the settings, the gear icon. And inside of here, you're going to see a settings for all of your calendars. So inside here, we have all of our different calendars. So I'm going to go to my demo class. This is my original one. And I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom and delete it. Now, before doing that, that's how we're going to get rid of it. That way it's not sitting. If anybody has subscribed to that calendar, we can share this out with our parents. And so our parents would have access to that calendar as well if you wanted to. Uh, if your students subscribe to it, because when they join that class, it gets added to their Google Calendar. They probably don't use it though. But any of those things that would be there, um, the minute we delete it, it removes it from all of them. So we don't have to worry about notifications or getting some parent five years from now that asks us, hey, I have this calendar. Why do I have that? We can get rid of it. Before I did that, though, before and again, just a suggestion that I was reading about. I'm going to turn on my demo class. And I'm going to go up to my view on my calendar. Excuse me and change it to schedule. So schedule gives me, in this case, four years. I'm going to rewind this all the way back to August, let's say 26. So the beginning of August and then four years in the future, it's not a big deal, or five years in this case. It's not a big deal. We're only going to have a year. But what it would do is give you a rundown of all of your events within your calendar. So if, if you thought, ah, this went really well, I want to keep that pacing, I want to keep everything here, you could do a screenshot of this, right, and just print it off, print it off as a PDF, print off your screenshot, something like that, and then store that, either print it physically or just print a digital copy and store that. So then next year when you go to, you can be like, oh yeah, this was a little bit quick or this was a little bit long, and you can make those notes and associate with that directly. Once you're happy, once you're all done though, like I said, I would pop in, and I'm just going to delete this guy. It does give you a warning. It says, are you sure? Do you want to make sure you permanently delete, delete this? This is my demo class. This is my original one. I'm going to say yes, and then it's going to be gone. It will no longer be found in my feeds on the left-hand side. It will not be one that, I, that sticks up. I won't be able to make it visible. So no big deal there. But that would definitely be something, would be a, a task that I would assign as well. So. And then finally, 
is declining provision classes and archiving active classes. So at the beginning of the year, uh, we run a script called Little Sis, a little SIS, and it syncs um, your PowerSchool enrollment with your uh, Google Classroom. And it creates a Google Classroom. You guys probably got notifications for all of these. We, we leave the student sync running for a while, but eventually we turn that off because we know that some kids are in a class or not in a class and, and there's a bunch of confusion. We can also sync some other stuff inside of there too, uh, Guardian data and, and whatnot. But we turn that off and we run it again at the beginning of semester two for our high school, so beginning of February, and we rerun those classes. A lot of people don't do anything with those Google Classrooms. They sit there in a provision state, waiting for you to accept or decline them. Up until the point that you accept or decline them, nothing happens to them. They just sit and wait. Uh, the students aren't invited. The students don't even know about that. So if you have a grade two class and you have a provision one, but then you create your own because you have a template, the only thing I would suggest is maybe going in there and, uh, and just declining that. I'll show you something really quickly here. This is actually the uh, the little SIP. This is this is my interface for the little SIS class, um, or little SIS, sorry, uh, application. And I just want to show you. how many classes we have here. And this is for the entire all of Palliser. So I get the data on all of Palliser on how many classes are provisioned and have never been accepted. So no one has ever done anything with them. So I showed this to some of our administrators and uh, inside of here, oops, let's go into, Overview. There we go. I showed this to some of our administrators and they were very interested. So we still have 1,338 provision classes that have never been. I see one person just to climb on. That's awesome. Uh, 1,338 classes that have been provisioned but never been accepted. So um, it's just easier for us to keep this nice and clean and for you on your end to keep your classes tab nice and clean as well. So, um, so just request that you do that. The other thing, you're gonna have some active classes. So we have this demo class, we're all done with that. We don't want to use it anymore, but we don't necessarily want to delete it. Click on the hot dog menu again and click archive. It tells you archive classes can't be updated unless you restore them. That means you can't add content to them and the students can't add content and it will be moved to your archived section. So we'll just go ahead and archive that. It removes it from the tile here, so we don't see it anymore making this just the classes that we want to use. So we will still see that if we pop in and go to our archive classes. So inside your archive classes, you can grab that one and go, oh, actually I needed something or a student wanted to hand an assignment in that wasn't ready there. You can restore that and it'll bring it back and make it active again. So it's not as though it's going away. It's just kind of throwing it into purgatory a little bit there, right? And just putting it inside of there. Um, the other thing to consider, just like on your main classes tile, if you wanna reorganize these guys into some certain scheme, you can reorganize them, you can drag them and drop them and make them work, right? And the same on this side. That's more of like a beginning of the year thing where you're getting everything set up as opposed to an end of the year thing. But, but essentially, um, that's kind of the rundown of the big things. Once you archive them, to me, they're all done. No, it doesn't kick out the students, but it doesn't allow them to do any more work in there. They can still go into their archive classes and see their work. They just can't submit work anymore. So it's it's kind of closed to them in a, in a manner, but it doesn't kick them out. I think I answered questions here. I'm going to throw this link in. I know a few people came late, so... I'm going to throw this link back in here one more time uh, if anybody has any questions on that one. But uh, what did I miss? I'm going to check on Dan's question about reviewing assignments and uh, if it does anything to the kids, just to, to confirm it for me. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would do uh, is create that. You can create one, I believe. 
of a archive class. I'm just going to pop in here and see if I go to my archive classes. And yeah, I can create a copy of it. So I can create a copy of my archive class if I want to. So you can go in either order, order, I guess. But sticking in this order just gives you a checklist to kind of go on your way down, John. So, yeah. What else did I miss? Is there any questions anybody had that if they do this, will they do that? Or should they kick all their kids out? I did read some stuff about, you know, kicking all the students out. Uh, it's not a difficult one to do. Um, if our if our students don't need access to this, uh, some people say don't leave them in here. Um, I guess that's a, a personal choice. If you wanted, you could uh, kick your students out. I sort of left that off my list because it's not something that I would do. So, if you were going to um, send your students out, oh, we don't have any students in that class. Let's go to, do I have any students in this one? Yeah, I have three. All we're gonna do is go to our people page, click on this to select all, and then we're gonna go down and remove them. So you don't have to remove them one at a time. You can remove them en masse. Um, they will lose access to your classroom and any content that you have inside of it. Uh, anything, they're, they're files that, that they've turned in or that uh, you've returned to them are still going to be in their drive. They're still going to have a classroom folder inside of their drive that they can still go around and take a look at and get those files, but they will not have access to the classroom anymore. So I do not suggest, uh, I, I'm going to finish my thought, Vicki, and then I'm going to come to your question. I do not suggest removing all of the students and then adding next year's students to that same classroom. And part of the Jason, you're mute. We cannot hear you. You're mute. There we go. How's that? Yeah, now we can hear you. First, Thank you, you Shabana. I, my, I don't know what happened. My computer froze up there, so we'll, oh. we'll move on to my phone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was saying I would not uh, just remove the students and then add new students because all of my due dates would be for last year and none of the due dates would be current. So you would still have to go through and adjust your due dates for each of the different assignments. Um, but also all of your content um, would come en masse to those students. So everything would come all at once. And, uh, and I don't know that we would necessarily uh, want that for our kids. So um, I'm gonna pop in here. Vicki, I can't get to your question. Can you ask me your question again, Vicki, and post it in the chat? so that I can see, or if someone can grab that and just read it out. What if last year you had a classroom titled Mass 6 that is archived, and this year you have Mass 6? Does it have issues with archiving the same name? No, it, it doesn't actually. There's, there's some alternate identifiers on the back end. Um, if you see within your classroom.google.com slash, there's some stuff, and then there's like a 10 or 15 digit string of, of uppercase and lowercase and numbers and stuff like that. That's the actual identifier that it's using to identify that. So, so there is no issue with regards to that at all. So, mm. 
Anybody else? Jason, I had a question. Um, yeah. You know, like when you created like a Google Classroom for us, but you had homeroom and different subjects, right? So for grade two, what we did, we archived all the other classes and we just used homeroom and then we had topics going. Is that the best for elementary? Like, what would you say, kind of? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think for elementary, for when we have, uh, when we have one teacher um, for multiple classrooms is to, to try and simplify it and have a, the least number of classrooms. We, it, it did that automatically because it pulled down all of your enrollments from power school. So you were in your children and you were assigned three or four different um, classes and it just created one for all of them. For elementary, I would definitely suggest declining all of them except the homeroom. So. so I didn't decline. I just archived all of them because my students were still like seeing all of them. So they were kind of confused. So I archived all of them. So now they just see homeroom and then they have topics under it. So, yep. At the very, probably at the very beginning of the year, you had the opportunity to archive or to decline them and oh. you probably accepted them all. Mm -hmm. And now, so now you, the only option you have is to archive. But at the beginning of the year, I would suggest when you, when you're thinking about it next year, just decline the ones you're not going to use, except the ones that you are. So, thank you, Jason. Yeah. Um, could you show again how to decline provision classrooms? You will see, and I'm sorry, but I can't uh, <laughs> with with mine uh, with my uh, phone here. I don't have uh, I have classroom on here. I think, but um, what you will see is uh, it'll just say on the main class tab where you see all of your tiles of classrooms. It'll say either accept. Or decline and so you just click decline on anything you want that's uh that's provision that you don't want to make use of so i use the classrooms and they find it easy to use multiple classrooms stacy let's see we'll let her catch up with her yes i do yeah so okay. um i use my homeroom and i um post in there every day um like a morning greeting and then the assignments that they'll be doing but then they need to go into the multiple classrooms to view videos and do the assignments and submit them there and so it's nicely organized i just find it nicely organized that way because then if i want i can look at all their grade uh like all their math work and i'll see everything that they've done for that subject um, and their grades and then same thing for language arts and then I've done some phys ed with them and some health with them and a little bit of si so like they can see it all and it's 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 nicely organized and I think if they get used to it in grade one they'll have no problems like they my class has gone there they're no they have no problems with it I, I totally I think that you have it I you hit the, the nail on the head there Stacy if they're used to it they're not going to have any issues. So whatever system you are using, that's the one that's going to work best for you. So yeah, yeah. No, sounds like Jessica does the same thing. And, and so. it's good because they're they're learning it now, and then by the time they hit grade three, grade four, grade like it'll be a breeze. Yeah. It'll, this is exactly how my daughter does it too, and she's in kindergarten, and she is a pro at navigating on her Chromebook. Like yep. she's like, no, mom, I, I got this. I know exactly where to go. I know how to open up my emails. Like she's, she's awesome. She'll open up her classrooms, her different classrooms, her emails. Um, you know, she's done little videos there to send back to her teacher. So, I mean, it's, it's, if you teach them young, they'll learn it. They're good. Yeah, they're, that's good. I know that's brilliant. So good. So yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for this. Absolutely. Can I ask somebody? Uh, and and Stacy, you were the last to talk. Can I ask you to just stop the streaming and stop the recording on this? I don't. Um, uh, yeah, I I think I can. I don't oh, think yeah. that I can okay, do that. Okay, stop streaming. And so stream has stopped. Stop recording. Perfect.